tales for dark nights. This broadcast is fan-funded, so become a member at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and support our Patreon at Patreon.com forward slash ChillingTales. safe reality and fallen into darkness. <laughs> there is no escape and there is no reprieve. Welcome to the Simply Scary Podcast, Season 2, Episode 13. I am GM Danielson, your guide through these twisted worlds of the most disturbed imaginations. As we open up this episode, we will bring you the stories of author Peter Lalish. This North Carolina native is not only an author and musician, but a filmmaker as well. He is steeped in the lore of the notoriously haunted region and draws his inspiration from that as well as his own supernatural experiences to craft an ultra-dark reality. In addition, this episode will be a finale of sorts as the Simply Scary podcast moves to hiatus for the next step in its evolution. So, with this, we have secured the final author in this inception of the series. Having my two assistants prepare him for the fear extraction, they have logged into the fear centers of Peter's warped imagination and have initiated the upload to the Chilling Entertainment Anywhere Wi-Fi spot. Prepare yourselves as we stare into the nightmare dimension of Peter Lalish and find that the abyss stares back. And now, on to our first frightening excerpt. Uploading gates, Jim. Oh, it looks like this one will start us off in a disturbing fashion. <laughs> Excellent. Give me the readout on our plot synopsis. <laughs> yes, yes, this is extremely disturbing indeed. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. it looks like we have a storm moving in on the radar. And it looks mean. As we open our theater of terror, we introduce you to a millennial who, despite her best efforts, has a hard time leaving home and a small town where nothing ever happens. And it keeps happening over and over and over again. Jordan Lester plots her escape in Nothing Ever Happens. I remember an episode of a kid's cartoon I used to watch when I was very young. The main character, a dog, spent his entire day moping around his house as it rained outside, complaining, Nothing ever really happens, while all sorts of whimsical stuff occurred everywhere that he didn't look. I think I'm that dog. Only I've looked everywhere, and I can confirm it. In this town... Nothing ever really happens. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
After I graduated, I moved back in with my parents at their suburban home while looking for a job. What else was I going to do? I had no money. Student loans were eviscerating my bank account, and no one seemed to have the positions I have the skills for. That's what I get for being an English major. Here's how my day goes. I wake up, usually around 11 a.m. I eat breakfast, generally cereal. A shower. I don't do my makeup because there's no point. Sometimes I go for a walk around my neighborhood in hopes that there's something interesting. There never is. I eat lunch. Usually something frozen. I lounge around the house all day. I eat dinner. I watch TV. And I go to bed. I was supposed to have moved out in a few weeks. It's been three years now. Good morning, sunshine! My parents tell me every morning. I used to say good morning back, but now it's usually some variant of... No, it's not. They still smile and go about their business. I wish I could just leave, but I'm stuck here. I've applied to jobs out of town, but I have no skills to speak of. Sometimes I apply in town, but I never hear back. All I can do is sit here and watch the world go by from my laptop. Nothing ever really happens. Sometimes I try to have little adventures, like... Maybe trying to climb up the tallest tree in the backyard using tools from the garage. Dangerous, I know. And yes, I've fallen before, but it's not like anything can happen to me. The only thing that ever happens is outside the borders of this stupid town. I've watched from my phone as you elected an incompetent man president, as world leaders bicker, as movies and games and books come out, that I will never get the chance to experience. I know the world is scary, but I would give anything to be there with all of you. You all get to move on with your lives, accomplish things, better yourselves. At midnight, my world becomes the start of May 7, 2014, all over again. And I find myself laying awake in bed, just as I was the first time. It's like that movie. You know the one where that man has to relive the same day on repeat. Only he could change the people around him. My life plays out as if some unseen power has hit the rewind button every night. No matter how much I scream at them, no one ever flinches. My parents just smile and go on with their day. The only news item that exists to them is Whole Foods stock tanking. For me, the internet is the only thing connecting me to the present day. Your present day. I see everything happen to everyone out there but me. I guarantee you, if nuclear war broke out and everyone on the planet was killed, I would still wake up on May 7th, 2014. Just like always. I can't remember any of my social media passwords, so I can't tell any of my friends or see what they've been up to since that day. I've tried to leave. Over and over. I don't know for certain it's the town doing this to me. It was worth a shot, but I couldn't get away. The family cars always run out of gas, and I can't steal anyone else's car. I've tried that too. Something always prevents me. I've tried walking, but the edge of town is just so far away, and I'm not that strong to begin with. Taking my bicycle doesn't help. The chain is worn, and before I get a quarter mile out, it always, always snaps. So I climb the tree. I've fallen. More than once. 
I've broken my back. And my neck. More than once. If I don't die instantly, I'm paralyzed and forced to lie in the grass as the hours tick by. No one ever comes to help. And then, no matter what, I'm back in my bed. It's the tallest tree in the neighborhood. I bet the view is spectacular. Maybe one day I'll make it to the top. Maybe I'll be able to see past the edge of town. I have a feeling, though, that the view will just show a world on repeat. Like the town and people around me. I don't know what to do, but to just live in it. Nothing ever really happens. <laughs> oh, what a desolate existence to find no joy in the coming day. I know exactly how she feels. Uh, but let us dive deeper into this desperate psyche. Uh, Jim, uh, I'm getting some weird interference with the audio signal. Uh, it's like... It's like there are these strange whispers coming through the headphones. Frankly, it's a little unnerving. Uh, and coming from a living ventriloquist figure with a stolen soul inside him. That's saying something. Yes, well, increase the Q-band and bring the occipital amplifier online. Uh, I don't know about these readings, GM. It looks like some sort of prefrontal cortex magnetic anomaly is trying to hijack the signal. We are only beginning. <laughs> now, boost the signal, you fools. All right, all right, but remember, you asked for it, Shinigami. Exploring the musical side of our author's anxiety, we find a musician who struggles to record his latest creation and reveal something much darker behind the music. We have tapped into our author himself as Peter Lalish performs his own story, Machine Gun. Let me get one thing straight here. I hate the sound of my own voice. This is a problem. As an independent musician, I play all the instruments on my own recordings. Well, program them mostly. Aside from guitars and vocals, everything's done on the computer. But I sing my own songs, and I hate listening back to them. Something about my voice just weirds me out. I've been recording for a new album, and ever since I wrote the first song, I knew it was The One. My first album got a lot of positive feedback from my friends, so I knew I wanted to follow it up, and a few songs into recording, I was sure this one would be even better than my first. You know? Like, I'm not that well-known or anything, but I had a feeling as soon as I finished writing the opening song that I had something. I used to write really generic lyrics and nothing very imaginative in the music department, but the more personal the lyrics got, the more I felt like the songs were exactly what they needed to be. My recording process is a bit sporadic. I don't organize like I should. I don't finish writing, then record all of one instrument for each song, finishing with the vocals. It's more of an I finished these lyrics and I gotta get this done now situation. So once I finish writing lyrics, I lay down all the tracks, usually in the same day. I do the vocals in one take because, like I said, I hate hearing my own voice. No matter how much compression and reverb and effect I put on it, it doesn't sound like me. It freaks me out, so I just leave it. Of course, the one time I decide to listen back, I should just stop being melodramatic and tell you what happened. 
I wrote one song called Machine Gun for the album. Bit of a curveball. Uh, most of what I do is very loud, energetic, abrasive rock music. Machine Gun was going to be different. Cleaner, less distorted, sort of a general breakup song. I've got the lyrics still, and it goes like, I love you and I adore you, but I can't do a damn thing for you. I love you, so please believe me when I say that you don't need me. Whoa, 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 I am a machine gun. Don't ask me why I put the machine gun line in there, I just thought it sounded cool. I wanted this one to sound really professional, less raw than the other songs on the album, so I made sure to get the vocals down first as soon as I made the drum and instrument tracks. I put the guitars in later. I'm living with my parents at the moment, so I waited for a day when they both left the house, set up my mic stand and condenser, got my recording program set up, and got down to business. I recorded the chorus first. It was the most stressful on my voice, and I figured I'd do the voices later once I needed a bit of a break. Those were some very high notes for me, <laughs> believe me. It was one of those few times when I felt really confident in my vocal abilities. Sometimes I feel like I'm straining. That time I felt myself sore. I could hear myself smiling as I finished the chorus. I had a hit on my hands, and I knew it. Just to be sure, of course, I decided to listen back. I wanted to be sure the take was good. When I hit play, I heard my own voice, but... Not like I'd heard myself singing before. I love you and I adore you, but I can't do a damn thing for you. I love you, so please believe me when I say that you don't need me. <sighs> I am a machine gun. I didn't sound strong at all. Scared, almost, as if I was going to burst into tears at any minute. By the second I am a machine gun, it was as if I was pleading for my life in song. I was confused. That was not at all what I had heard when I recorded myself. I checked my effects chain. My voice sounds a lot weaker when I don't have effects on it, so I figured that was it. Everything was on. Compression, reverb, everything. I deleted the track, took a sip of water, and recorded again. My performance wasn't as good as I thought the first take had been, but I figured it'd be adequate. And then I rewound and I played it back. This was how I knew something was wrong. I love you and I adore you, but I can't do a damn thing for you. My voice was even more broken than before. By the time I got to I love you so please believe me, the voice that was and wasn't mine broke down into sobs. I love you so please believe me. When I say that you don't need me, oh God. I am a machine gun. Oh my God. I am a machine gun. I deleted that track very quickly and I figured I'd be done for now. You know, leave a project, come back later, and it'll sound better, right? I recorded again after dinner. This time I figured I'd just do the entire song in one go. All the way through, one take, like I usually do. By the end, I was out of breath, but it felt good. It felt solid, like something I could really be proud of. I figured I'd give it a listen just in case. I heard nothing. Just the drums and bass tracks. Confused, I checked my microphone connection. I checked my levels. Everything seemed fine, nothing out of the ordinary, but... Somewhere between me and the computer, everything was getting cut. Or so I thought, until I saw the little peaks on the waveform. You all know how sound looks when you record it, right? The little waves that get bigger when it gets louder? Sometimes when you record a quiet sound, it looks like nothing except for a couple of barely noticeable peaks. And that's what I saw. I muted all the soundtracks except for that one and pushed up the volume, then dragged the marker to the beginning and hit play. Quiet, scared breathing began as the song started. It continued through the whole intro up to where the singing was supposed to start, then passed it for a few bars. 
At the back of the sound, I heard another voice. My voice, but still not mine. You can't do anything right. Are you going to sing, or are you just giving up? <laughs> the breathing broke down into sobs again. I knew that was me, too. I can't. It's, it's, it's been... Don't give me that. We wrote this, and you're just not good enough to put it out there. Now sing! I love you. <laughs> you talentless waste. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. Useless freak. It didn't get any better. The voice of the back hurled abuse as the voice in front just sobbed and coughed and tried and failed to sing. It was painful to hear. I hate hearing people get yelled at. I've had to hear my friend get chewed out by their parents while I was on the phone with them, but this was me. Insulting me. Bullying me. It was so much worse. I'm never leaving you alone. You need me. Without me, you're nothing. I made you like this. When the song ended, the voice in front broke down again and sounded as if it was collapsing onto the ground away from the microphone. Pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. Do it again, and do it right this time, or you're not getting dinner, you talentless freak. The voice in front sounded like it was getting up. It inhaled and exhaled and tried to calm itself down. This is the one. Do it. A click, and the sound ended. I didn't know what to make of it, so I deleted the entire project file. Programming, arrangement structures, all that. Especially the vocals. I'm replacing that song on the album with something more energetic. Something more like a party song. Fits the album better anyway. I didn't want it to get lost forever, though. I like the song. I think it's well written. So I recorded a bit of it, acoustic, and put it online. I hope you like it. I didn't listen back to it this time. So, it seems that you can definitely be your own worst critic. And with a split personality like that, who needs enemies? Onward and upward, unto the twilight. Well, howdy folks, the other half here. You want this show to keep going, I know, I know. But we do that with your support. It ain't free, you know. So besides becoming a patron and a member at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com or Patreon.com slash Chilling Tales, you might be asking, hey other half, how can I support your form of killer broadcasting? I ain't got no scratch. Well, we've come up with other ways to help us keep this show dead alive. When shopping with Amazon, use the link ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com forward slash Amazon or simply ScaryPodcast.com forward slash Amazon and a portion of your purchases go to keeping this Frankenstein's monster pumping with voltage. So remember, use ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com forward slash Amazon and simply ScaryPodcast.com forward slash Amazon when purchasing through there to help promote fan-funded entertainment like ours. Now... Back to the show. Uh, uh oh, guys, uh, something's wrong. We're getting a severe fear feedback loop from the connection. Uh, it looks like this next story will be extreme.
Well, this looks like the perfect time to warn you listeners that this story deals with extreme subject matter, including self-harm. So proceed with caution. As the other half has warned in previous episodes, you might want to get the little crumb crunchers, or as I like to call them, the little blood suckers, into the next room, or as I would do, lock them into the dungeon below. If you have one, of course. Some don't, but I happen to consider myself a rather blessed vampire, since I have not only one, but three. As we unfold this tale, we find a young lady whose numbness to the world around her takes disturbing turns as she finds a way to feel again. Michelle Ragsdale slices it up, along with Ashley Tolfo, Heather Ordover, and Brendan McNair in an all-female cast in Self-Predator. I've always been a quiet woman. I've never been one to speak up or speak out, even in a crisis situation. I think it's just a case of extreme introversion, but it gets me into trouble sometimes. So when I walked into the office on Thursday, took some papers to the paper cutter and proceeded to slice off all four fingers on my left hand, I didn't scream. I don't know why. I think it must have been born out of a desire not to bother anyone. I didn't want to inconvenience them with my own little problems, not even if those problems involved me losing fingers. I covered my mouth with my one hand that was still intact, tears rolling out of my eyes. I couldn't feel the pain. The only thing I could feel was the horror at the sight before me, those four useless bloody appendages now separated from my hand. But I didn't scream. I looked left and right, hoping no one had seen me. Luckily, no one had. They were all mesmerized by the work in their cubicles, the water at the water cooler, the glowing screens in front of them. I looked at the fingers before me. I should have called emergency services. I should have put them in a bag full of ice, but... But I did none of that, too terrified that I'd be inconveniencing someone. I know, I know, but I told you. I hate to bother people. I realize that the next thing I did seems a bit... bizarre. But the day before, at lunch, I'd overheard some of my co-workers discussing things they'd read on the internet, and the topic of bodies came up. One of them had read a theory based on the belief that the body uses nutrients put into it to heal wounds and grow nails and hair. By that logic, she said, if you lost a limb, and you were to put that limb back into your own body by, say, consuming it, it would grow back. To which all of her friends laughed and said things like, (laughs) and, Ha! Absurd. (laughs) And... That is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. I agreed, silently, from my corner of the break room. Like I said, I'm not much of a talker. Now, staring at the bloody sight before me, that conversation must have been chewing at the back of my mind. I picked up one of my fingers, the pointer, with my working hand and looked it over, took a deep breath, then shoved the whole thing into my mouth. I chewed as best I could. The soft meat and hard bones gave way between my teeth with some difficulty. The taste was... disgusting! But I finally choked it down and swallowed the pulpy mess. I breathed slowly, trying to maintain my composure. For this to work, I'd need to eat the other three as well. I took another finger and popped it in. It was easier this time now that I knew what to expect. I crunched through the bones, feeling the sickening crack resonate through my jaw. Then I stopped mid and looked around. Someone had to have seen me at this point. 
No one had. I resumed chewing and swallowed again, then shoveled the last two fingers into my mouth. I chewed them as if I hadn't eaten in weeks and swallowed quickly, feeling the chunks of bone scrape against the sides of my throat. I took the paper with the telltale blood stains on it and threw it into the recycling. then sprinted to the bathroom and stuck my mangled hand under a warm tap to rinse it off. It almost felt like a dream. One second I was perfectly able. The next, my hand was ruined. Forever. Unless the finger theory was true. Which it obviously wasn't. The absurdity of what I had done finally set in. I had just made a horrible, horrible mistake. How could I have been so stupid? I took the day off, claiming I had a headache, never showing my hand to anyone. I wrapped it in a paper towel and kept it in my pocket as I headed back to my dingy apartment. I decided I needed some dinner. A frozen Indian meal sat in my mini fridge freezer. I took it out of the box and poked a few holes in the plastic film, then popped it into the microwave. I set the time for three minutes and closed the door with my left hand. Wait. My left hand? I staggered back in surprise. My left hand, which I had so badly destroyed earlier that very day, was now whole again. Sometime in the last hour, on my way home, my fingers had grown back, covered in new moist skin in stark contrast to my dry, flaky palm. A mix of surprise and fear overtook me as I stared at my hand, turning it over and over, entranced. The beep of the microwave snapped me out of it. I shook my head and continued the process of stirring and eating the meal, as if everything was normal. As I ate, I couldn't help looking at my new hand. The dry palm and the moist fingers looked so in perfect together, contrasting in a way that sickened me. I could barely finish my tikka masala. The desire burned in the back of my mind as I showered and got ready for bed. I couldn't sleep. I kept looking at my hand. The imperfection of it all disgusted me, even worse than the sight of the missing fingers had. I knew what I had to do. I couldn't live with this. I ran into the kitchen and collected a cutting board, a steak knife, and a meat tenderizer. I started to cut through the wrist. It took some doing, but I was able to saw through the bone with the serrated edge. The pain was blinding, but I pushed through. I needed to. One side separated the hand from my arm. I wrapped the stump in more paper towels and took the meat tenderizer in my dominant hand. I raised it above my head and brought it down on the severed appendage with a sickening crunch. I struck it again and again into what used to be a hand was nothing more than a stack of flesh and sinew, holding a pile of splintered pieces of bone. Then it cut it into bite-sized pieces, bone and all, and I started shoveling them into my mouth. The bone shards hurt as it choked them down. I hadn't done a good job of breaking them down enough, but I had to swallow them, or something would go wrong. As I gagged on the last piece and managed to swallow, I wondered what would have happened if I'd left the bones out. Would the skin have grown back without the support under it? Would I have been left with a floppy, useless blob of fingers? 
I hoped I wouldn't have to find out. I sat and waited. And waited. Nothing happened. My eyes filled with tears as I realized the horrible mistake I'd made. There was no way to hide this one from my co-workers. I had gone too far. Then, I felt the pulling. I ripped the paper towel off my stump and looked in horrified awe as I saw five fingers push out of the bloody hole where my hand had been, crawling out of the wound. They were followed by a palm, no longer dry and cracked. As the hand slid into place, I felt a bit woozy. This couldn't be real. And yet, it had to be. If it was a dream, I'd have awakened hours ago. I wiped the blood off my wrist. There was a barely noticeable line between my arm and my new hand. Like a tan line. Another imperfection. But one I could overlook. My eyes moved to my right hand. Another palm plagued with constant dryness. I'd had this problem for a while. No amount of lotion ever fixed it. But maybe. Maybe I'd found my solution. The process was far more difficult this time. I'm not as good with my left hand. But I managed to separate my dominant hand at the wrist and break it down with my meat tenderizer, making sure to break the bones down into much smaller pieces this time before I started shoving it into my mouth. This time I didn't even bother cutting it up. I ripped off chunks and swallowed the skin, muscle, and bits of bone down with a ravenous appetite. This one grew back much faster, crawling its way out of my stump less than a minute after I swallowed the last piece. I looked at my hands, now perfectly moist, just like I'd always wished they'd be. Then I remembered my feet. I had the same problem with my feet. My heels always cracked and bleeding, the pads of my toes covered with flaky, dead skin. I took one of my socks off and examined it. I fought back the desire to rip them from my limbs and shove them down my throat. I couldn't do what I'd done to my hands to my feet. That would be going too far. Would it? The bones in my feet took longer to break than the ones in my hands, but I persevered, pounding at the severed appendages with a fury that I'd never known I could conjure up. I sat in a chair as I smashed them, as I couldn't keep myself standing for obvious reasons. Within a minute of my swallowing the last bloody chunk of each appendage, a fresh new one pushed its way out of my ankle. Dry skin no longer a problem. I was addicted. I ran up to the bathroom and looked into the mirror at my eyes. I'd always needed contact lenses. I had stayed up so late eating my own body that they were now bloodshot. They were easy to pop out with a spoon, and I snipped each optic nerve with a pair of scissors. They had the consistency of grapes as I chewed through them and swallowed. I was blind for all of 30 seconds before I felt them grow back, looking at myself in the mirror with perfect vision. I couldn't stop. I cut off my constantly chapped lips and swallowed them next. They returned rich and full seconds later. I carefully removed my scalp with my scissors and choked down mouthfuls of hair and skin. They returned, dandruff-free and full of volume. I looked at my face in the mirror, crazed with a desire to keep going. I had to. I wanted to consume my entire body and grow it back. Absolutely perfect. 
I looked like a maniac. I realized this rather quickly and shook my head. What had I been doing? This was insane! I, I couldn't keep eating myself. It was wrong. But my eyes kept drifting back to my face. My stupid, asymmetrical face. With the nose just a bit too big. And the eye sockets just a bit too off-center. And the forehead just a bit too large. I had to stop. They found me screaming on my bathroom floor. My face covered in my own blood. And my hands stabbed through with shards of glass. My face had grown back after I choked it down, but it wasn't what I wanted. It hadn't changed. I hadn't eaten the bones. I'd put a fist through the mirror in rage. Someone next door must have called emergency services because they put me screaming on a stretcher and carried me to the emergency room. They told me that I'd permanently damaged the nerves in my hand. I couldn't move it or feel anything. Useless. They told me they're going to amputate tomorrow. On my way to my hospital room after that meeting, I saw the room where they keep the blades. Scalpels. Bone saws. Thoughts raced through my head. That's why I'm sitting in my hospital bed just after midnight, holding the saw I stole a few minutes ago, hovering above my right wrist. I had to write this down to explain myself, in case something goes wrong and someone sees me. I can fix everything. I just have to do it myself. It's not like I can just tell them in person, either. I've always been a quiet woman. GM, uh, we're getting a power build up and it, it must be from the storm. Oh, I don't think we can push it much further. Oh, that last story may have been too much. We are redlining peoples. We will continue <laughs> until the world burns. Okay. Uh, this doesn't look good. GM has a weird look in his eye. Look, we only have a couple more stories to go, so let's just see where this goes. Uh oh. Okay. From Chilling Entertainment. The creators of the popular website and YouTube channel Chilling Tales for Dark Nights comes Don't Look Away, a chilling compendium of 35 hair-raising, hand-picked tales of terror from the mind of author William Dolphin and illustrated by Emily Holt. Each of the dozens of stories in Dolphin's frightening debut collection is bound to tingle your spine and leave you looking over your shoulder. If you enjoy a good shudder, Dolphin's terrifying tome will satisfy your craving for the macabre. But be prepared. Lock your doors, check your windows, and whatever you do, don't look away. Now available on Amazon.com. Now, we will explore a digital devil in the machine as a gamer signs up to test a new game and takes on more than she bargained for.
when the battle takes a much darker turn. Brindelyn McNair and Jesse Cornett perform in Terminal 13. One of my hometown's biggest claims to fame is our resident video game developer, Mark III Software. They've been cranking out games since the early 90s, and they've gone from just a few guys in a little office to their own building off of Canterbury Boulevard. You might have played their Rapid Fire series. You know, that shooter with all of the wall running and adolescent jokes. Stupid, I know, but stupid fun. Anyway... My personal favorite thing about Mark III is their beta testing program. Anyone in the local area can sign up, and they'll pay you to come in and test out their works in progress. I've done a few tests with them, and my girlfriend was coming to visit this holiday, so I figured I'd apply for a four-day test with them so I could have some extra spending money to treat her. So when I finally got the call from their representative, I was over the moon. They asked me a few questions, then made sure I understood the non-disclosure agreement I'd be signing. That's why I'm writing it here. I need to tell someone about this, and I figure this is where I do it. Besides, if they do find me, they can't do anything worse than sue me. Anyway, this test was to take place from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day for four days. At the end of it all, I'd be receiving $500, With that kind of cash, I could give my girlfriend a really nice holiday and still have a few dollars left over. I said yes and started planning out my driving schedule around it. I showed up the first day and was introduced to my testing group. There were 11 other people there, all guys, so I felt a little out of place. But none of them seemed to pay any mind to the fact that I was the only woman in the group, so I felt very welcome. A staff member signed us in and walked us all over to the testing center, where we put all of our phones and electronic devices in little lockers. We all headed off to the lounge, chatting about Skyrim and other games on our way there. They gave us all the snacks and coffee we could want while telling us about our test. We'd be testing a new online action game they'd been working on called Meteorica. The deal was, you'd create a character using all these different classes and weapons and factions, and you'd explore an open world searching for these shards of a massive meteor that had broken up over the planet. When a shard was found, it would trigger a team-based fight between the two nearest factions, and the winning team scored the shard. I was really excited to hear about the game, and even more so when I got to give it a try for myself. The combat mechanics are fast-paced and easy to pick up, but the game is still challenging for players that have been at it for a while. The customization is awesome too. You can be a muscular sword-swinging melee specialist or a sniper ninja or anything in between. Highly recommend. The testing worked like this. They sit you down at a computer, and they first calibrate your heart rate, then your eyes. There's a sensor bar beneath the computer monitor that tracks where your eyes are looking on the screen. While you play, the test moderators can see what you're looking at. It's a little creepy, but it's pretty cool. Anyway, when we broke for lunch the first day, I noticed something odd. The way the test center was set up, there were 12 different computer terminals, each numbered 1 through 12. I was at terminal 9. There was a little divider separating the test room from the lounge, and I noticed in the lounge there was a single terminal turned off with a sign declaring it 13. I turned to one of the nearby staffers. What's with that one? Number 13? That's our backup for testing when we need it. The monitor's kind of broken, though. And we don't use it unless absolutely necessary. 
Made sense. They ordered us some sandwiches for lunch, and we played for a few more hours afterwards before we all went home. They'd kept us hydrated, so I didn't even have a headache after eight straight hours of gaming. I went home, ate dinner, played more games, what else am I going to do, and went to bed. The next day, we all arrived at the testing center to find that terminal number five had been completely fried. There'd been a lightning storm the night before, and a surge protector malfunction had failed to protect it from a shock. The staff informed us that one of us was going to have to go home and wouldn't be receiving our $500, which elicited a chorus of groans from all of us. What about number 13? Um, the monitor's all messed up. (laughs) So what? I signed up for four days of testing and I want four days of testing. Let me use number 13. And so, tester number five was transferred to testing station 13, and the test resumed as normal. Everything went pretty smoothly, so far as I could tell, and we broke for lunch around noon like we had the day before. They brought us pizza that day. I looked over at tester number five and noticed he looked a little bit shaken. You all right, man? Yeah, I'm fine. He nodded and went back to nibbling his pizza. He didn't seem that hungry. The test continued a few more hours after lunch before I heard a commotion coming from the lounge. I turned and noticed people running past the divider. Tester number five must have been in trouble. I couldn't see much from where I was sitting, but I did see a couple of people carrying him out. He looked even worse than I'd seen before. I could hear sirens. Must have been an ambulance. I figured the monitor was just causing some sort of reaction and the guy was just an epileptic, so I let it slide without questioning it. We all went home without mentioning it once. The next day, we all went back to our normal computing duties. I think everyone was too afraid to say anything. No matter how much I got immersed in the game world, though, I couldn't stop thinking about the terminal. Maybe it wasn't just epilepsy. I was too curious to pay attention to my game. So, when we broke for lunch, I made sure to bring a soda back to the terminal. And, near the end of the day, I made sure to accidentally jostle it during a big fight and spill it all over the computer. I played it off like I was horrified that it'd be taken out of my pay and everything. The staff reassured me that I wouldn't have to pay for the damage, that they could fix it, but that I'd be without a terminal. I immediately suggested Terminal 13. But that's the mo- I cut the staff member off before he could protest about the monitor again. I wanted to complete my test, and I wasn't about to let one guy fainting dissuade me from using a broken monitor. Okay... They relented, and I went home, satisfied that I was about to learn the truth behind Terminal 13 on my last day. I came in the next day getting all kinds of looks from my testing group. They looked worried for me. I assured them I'd be fine, that I wouldn't have a problem, that I could handle a broken monitor. The staff set me up at Terminal 13 the same way as before, testing my heart rate and calibrating my gaze. The monitor didn't look broken to me, but I didn't say anything. Maybe my vision wasn't good enough to see it. The vision calibration took a little longer than the other monitor had, but I didn't think anything of it. Then we started the game, and I started seeing a few abnormalities. When I logged into my temporary Meteorica account, I looked at my custom character, the magic-wielding assassin Elizabeth. She looked the same as she always had, aside from one thing. Her eyes. Her eyes looked... human. The graphics of the game were very cartoonish on purpose. 
but Elizabeth's eyes were straight up human eyes. Photorealistic. So much so that I couldn't have told them from real life if you'd put them side by side. It was a small detail, but one that I couldn't overlook. I zoomed in closer to my character view and realized they were my eyes. The vision calibration, I thought. It had to have been that. I took off my headphones and turned to the test moderator. Is this some kind of a joke? Um, excuse me? He shook his head and asked what I was talking about. What are you talking about? I pointed to Elizabeth's eyes. He couldn't see it. To him, it just looked like a regular Meteorica character. He complimented my attention to detail in designing her face and told me to continue. I did. I dropped into the open world and linked up with a party of three other characters looking for brawls to join. When we found one, Elizabeth appeared on screen alongside the other characters in a fighting stance. Her eyes were still exactly like mine. Then I looked at the other faces on the screen and realized they all had my eyes, too. <gasps> I gasped in shock, then took a few deep breaths. This is just in my head. It was me trying to find something wrong with the monitor. I just knew it. I kept my chin up and kept playing. We dropped into the brawl. We had ten minutes to score as many kills on the enemy team as we could and the team with more kills would win the match. I started lining up a long shot, but then got sniped by an enemy warrior named Edgelord X666. Classy. You have died. The camera zoomed in on him from my dead character's position, and I saw the same eyes in his face too. This was happening too often to be my mind making it up. I figured I could report it in the survey later, and they'd maybe try to fix it, but then the eyes in that face turned and looked directly out of the screen, right into mine. I saw a flash of something before it cut back to spectating my other teammates while I waited to respawn. I couldn't say what it was at first. After I respawned and got slashed in half by an enemy ninja, You have died. They made eye contact with me too, and I saw another flash. This time I could tell what it was. It was a butterfly. Every time I got killed, the character that had killed me would make direct eye contact with me with my own eyes, and I'd see a flash of an image of a butterfly with its wings torn off. We ended up losing that match, mainly because I was too freaked out to be very effective. You lose. The winning team all appeared on screen, all with the same eyes. My eyes. They all looked at me for just a moment, and I saw the butterfly once more before the screen shifted back to the loading screen to put me back in the open world. I blinked a few times, then went to the restroom and got some water, still hoping against hope that this was all in my head. It wasn't. Every game we played, every time I died, my killer would look straight out of the screen and I'd see that same butterfly. I almost asked to quit, but I've always been a little too competitive. All I could think about was how tester number five couldn't handle this and how he'd been hospitalized because of it. I didn't want to give in. I wanted to rise above it and take control. As we broke for lunch, I resolved to keep fighting and become the best player I could. The less I got killed, the less I'd have to see that butterfly. Every time I saw it, I felt a little sicker and a little more scared. I wasn't about to let some admittedly scary computer glitch get the better of me. 
I wolfed down my sandwich and waited for them to give me the okay to play again. People tried to ask me if I was okay. I'd respond with an, I'm fine, trying to sound determined. I admit I was a little shaken, but I wasn't letting this thing beat me. I wanted to win. When they let us back on the terminals, I pulled up Elizabeth again and looked straight into her eyes. My eyes. We're going to do this, girl. Let's go. We dropped into another brawl. And immediately got killed. You have died. Before the opposing player could make eye contact with me, I shut my eyes and waited five seconds. Then I opened them again. It was like it knew when I was going to open my eyes. The enemy who had killed me was still staring out of the screen. The butterfly flashed before me. I jumped in fright. That wasn't going to help. So I took a swig of my water and got focused. I hadn't scored a kill all day. No one was going to kill me again this match. Not if I could help it. Breathing hard, I clicked respawn. The moment Elizabeth appeared on screen, I dodge rolled to the left just in time to avoid a spawn camper trying to gank me. In his one second of confusion, I sliced him in half with my laser sword. Elizabeth killed Mikey777 appeared on the screen. And so did my eyes, looking straight into mine. This time the butterfly didn't flash. This time I felt a relief. An overwhelming sense of relief. And an invigorating burst of energy. I wanted more. And if I had to slaughter everyone on the map to get it, I would. The rest of the match, I played like a pro. Dodging, blocking, and scoring kill shots one after the other. Every time, the eyes would appear and that energy would flow through me. I was breathing harder than before. I was getting exhausted somehow, but I wasn't going to let myself stop. I ended up winning that match for my team. As my team appeared on screen, all with my eyes somehow embedded in their faces, Elizabeth looked directly at me. She smiled just before the screen changed to the loading screen. It was almost a smile of malice. I kept playing. I only let the occasional kill slip by, but every time I saw that butterfly, I let the fear fuel me. I let every match for the rest of the day. I kept leveling Elizabeth up. Levels 10, 20, 30, 40 all seemed to fly by. Just as the test was about to end, I was finishing up my last match. I ended at the last second with a triple kill using my Thunderstrike ability, lightning from the sky. It looked amazing. You win. Blue team wins appeared on the screen and all four team members looked directly at me and smiled. The loading screen appeared and when it changed again, Elizabeth was standing there next to my experience points meter. I was so close to reaching level 50 and if I didn't make it, I was going to flip my lid. I watched as the XP bar slowly climbed toward the edge and when it finally made it, and 49 flipped over to 50, I pumped my fists in the air and whooped. I had beat the glitch. Elizabeth turned her head. Her eyes met mine. My eyes met mine. Then there was another flash. That damn butterfly. Another flash and the butterfly appeared again. This time, its wings were reattached. Another flash, and the butterfly was flying away. Elizabeth was still staring at me, the corners of her mouth curling into that malicious smile again. Good job, 
was what it said when the next flash appeared. Elizabeth's smile was too high now. Her mouth corners had gone past her nose and were on the way up to the eyes. Just before the screen disappeared and dropped me back into the open world, five more words flashed before my eyes. And then, nothing. I exited the open world, went to my character creator screen, and looked at Elizabeth. Her eyes had changed. From the photorealistic eyes that looked exactly like mine to her normal cartoon eyes. I took a deep breath and let it out. That was about when six rolled around and it was time to get out. They handed us each $500 Amazon gift cards and told us we'd be receiving Meteorica Alpha keys as soon as it went live. I went home in a daze. I didn't play another game for the rest of the night. As I lay awake in bed that night, trying to put the events of the week out of my head with thoughts of what I could treat my girlfriend to with all this money, I couldn't get those five words that had appeared on the screen out of my mind. I had no idea what they meant or why they'd said them to me. They still freak me out to this day. That flash had said, you're one of us now. Oh, lightning struck the Wi-Fi adapter. Oh, there's been an extreme power surge. Uh, I can't shut down the signal. It's gone rogue. Uh, uh, yeah. This is it. We have reached the pinnacle of fear. It is alive. It is alive. It is alive. <laughs> Now, for our final installment of Hell on Earth. Jeez, and I thought I chewed the scenery. Yeah, I don't know. I thought it was pretty good. Hi, this is executive producer of the Simply Scary Podcast, Jesse Cornett. Now, you can experience music and much more craziness from me and my production company, Pleroma Productions, in the future. Keep up with what's going on by following me on SoundCloud at www.soundcloud.com forward slash Pleroma Productions dash LLC. You'll get to experience music and much more from the revolving door that is my psyche, along with other treats still to come. You can also keep up with my buddy Archie Carlisle for the lowdown on upcoming material from Pleroma Productions as we lay the groundwork for more important independent entertainment like you've enjoyed here on this show. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just look for me, Archibald Carlisle, on Facebook and on YouTube. Thanks, buddy. And I want to personally thank all of you for being there as fans of the Simply Scary Podcast and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. And now, boys and girls, back to the show. Thank you. A student who moonlights as a college art department's off-campus bus driver delivers her passengers to an exotic artistic performance exhibition that invites the audience to lose themselves within the exhibit. But when losing yourself, there is always the chance you will never find you again. Ashley Telfo performs in our final excerpt along with Jason Hill, Brendalyn McNair and John Evans in Conceptual Art. I drive a van. No... Not in a creepy way. I go to a large university, and I have a job with the arts program there. Some of the events we organize for the students are off the campus, 
So they need someone to drive a university vehicle to shuttle the students there. That's my job. I stay on the clock for the entire length of the event I'm driving to. So, basically I'm getting paid to go to arts programs. Sometimes they're really enjoyable. Like that outdoor show with the giant puppets. Or the time we went to the local Rocky Horror Picture Show midnight screening for Halloween. Sometimes they're boring. Like the experimental documentary festival that just didn't make any sense. This event didn't fit into either category. My boss, Andrea, sent me an email the week prior about my schedule, asking me if I wanted to do a Friday night event somewhere in Durham. When I asked her what it was, she said it was a performance art theater piece in an abandoned shopping center. I figured it could go either way, and I'd still get paid, so I told her I'd do it. Abandoned shopping centers, let me tell you, are just as suspicious as they sound. But the events are sanctioned through the university. We'd been given tickets, and everyone had emergency contacts, so I figured if Andrea didn't see any red flags, there weren't any to find. The night of the event, I did my usual routine. Got dinner an hour beforehand, clocked in on my phone, picked up the van from the spot our other driver left it, and took it to the loop where we would be picking up the kids. I always get to the spot way too early. I just don't want to miss anyone. I killed time listening to music through the car stereo and looking up the event location on my phone. The route my app gave me started out like a normal trip to Durham, but then the path veered down a few roads I'd never heard of before. Sketchy? Yes. But again, it was a job. And again, Andrea hadn't seen any problems with it. So, why should I? The student arts event leader showed up about five minutes before we were supposed to leave. The rest of the group piled into the van along with him, filling it up. I groaned inwardly. This guy, John, was the one who always tried to jack my iPod and play stuff I didn't want to hear. But... A job is a job, so I had to deal with him on occasion. I dialed in the route again on my phone and pulled out of the college lot. Putting on my own playlist before John could get his filthy little hands on the aux cord. A thumping beat filled the van as we pulled out of the loop and headed towards the highway. The 30-minute drive was uneventful, aside from John's usual whining about how no one knows the music I play and can I play some pop music please and a couple of complaints to turn it down. I didn't listen. It's my last semester on the job and it's not like I can get fired for playing music. When we got there, the shopping center was packed with cars. I let everyone out in front. A masked woman stood behind a table with some papers and a money box on it. There was no line. I figured everyone was already inside. I put the van in the biggest spot I could find in the back of the lot, hopped out, and headed up to the table as my group went in ahead of me. I'm with them. Ah, uh, Alexis. We're glad to finally have you. She smirked. Or, at least it seemed like it. I couldn't tell through the mask. Um, how do you know my name? Your group said you'd be here soon. Oh. I felt myself turning red. 
It's all right. Here are the instructions. I hope you enjoy the installation. You'll have to experience it without your group, however, as they're already one room ahead of you. It's not like I like them anyway. I looked at the paper. Something Else. An immersive installation by Whitechapel Theater. Rules. Number one. Do not move from one room to the next until the doors are opened for you. Number two. Do not speak. Number three. You may interact with the performers, but do not touch them unless they touch you first. Number four. Lose yourself. That was it. I love weird theater. So I nodded to the woman and went inside. Ambient music played within the first chamber. The whole room painted half black and half pale blue. On my left side, the black side, a man in a hood sat in a chair in front of a desk, sleeping while somehow scribbling words on a piece of paper. On my right, a woman entangled in a network of red strings slowly rotated wrapping more and more of the threads around her. I walked through the space slowly. As I approached the door, already forgetting the first rule, the writer shot out an arm in front of me, and I stopped short. His outstretched arm held a piece of paper, the one he'd been scribbling on. I didn't understand. I looked to the rotating woman, and pointed at the piece of paper with a questioning expression. She nodded as her eyes met mine. I took the paper, a page torn out of a dictionary with a marker scribble on it. The structure is made of you, but it is not you. I pocketed it, confused, but never one to question surreal art. The woman tangled in red string stopped her rotation and came across the room, the strings tightening as she did. She took my hand, placed it on the door, and gently pushed. It swung open, lighter than I had expected. Then she released my hand and pointed through the doorway. I went through as she pulled it closed behind me. The second chamber was filled with the sound of ocean waves. The room was completely dark and empty, aside from a candle-lit vanity mirror. Papers, open notebooks, and business cards reading The Architects covered the attached desk. A woman in a red dress and a masquerade mask entered the lit area and gestured for me to sit down, which I did. She produced a deck of cards and placed it on the table, then took my hand and placed it on top. She slid it to the left, up, back down, and to the left again, forming a triangle. She then removed the cards from the corners of the triangle and laid them next to each other, face down. She slowly overturned each card. The Three of Hearts, the Seven of Diamonds, and the Ace of Spades. She then began to write on a small piece of paper, 
which she passed to me as she finished, along with one of the business cards. You begin from an unremarkable place. However, you are filled with desire for something, but you cannot summon the passion to act on that desire. Your own self is holding you back. I stared at it, a little offended, then put it in my pocket as well. She rose, opened the door, and waved me through. Architects, structures, I wasn't sure what to make of it, but I continued on. This is where I started to get the feeling something was off. I found myself in a much smaller room. The walls were pink with black brush strokes all over. A calligraphy brush lay against the wall, dripping with black ink. A sign on the floor said, Write something you want. I looked at the walls. The writing was all different styles and handiworks, but the words were all the same. I want to lose myself. Hundreds of times, over and over, on all four walls. Lose yourself, the rules had said. I scanned the room and jumped to see someone in a white jumpsuit in a corner. They gestured to me to write. I picked up the brush, found an empty spot on the wall, and started to write. I want to live. The jumpsuited person frowned at me. They must have been expecting another repeat. But they crossed the room and opened the door. Yellow paint covered the fourth chamber cracking in places to expose brick. The ceiling was higher than the other rooms. I know, because I looked up and saw a chair dangling from a rope, tied into a hangman's noose. A man and a woman stood in the room, looking down at the ground, their heads at odd angles. I realized that they were posing as if they, too, were hanging from ropes. And I shivered. You do not need to be anything. You only need to be... They both gestured toward the double doors, which opened automatically. Lose yourself. They both dropped to the ground and lay still. I could see the next room through the doors. The fifth and largest chamber had a line of beds, six in total. In the center was a stone monolith. I guessed it was about my height. Strange symbols glowed in blue on it. I could see my group, just leaving the chamber through the doors on the other side. They must have spent some time in there. It was then that I was overcome with panic. Not because of anything I saw. I just felt... awful. And I know it sounds stupid now, but... 
I had to do something. I ran to the woman lying on the ground and whispered quickly. Hey, I know it said not to talk to you, but, um, I think I left my car unlocked. The woman looked up at me, her face having dropped her character. She sighed, full of disdain. Fine. There's an exit door in the wall over here. We have to keep the flow going, so you won't be able to experience the fifth room. But you can rejoin in the sixth. I mumbled a quick thank you and ran for the door on the side. An understated frame, missable at first glance, leading me into a gray, undecorated hallway. I sprinted toward the exit and found myself back in the parking lot. It took what felt like hours to get to the van, lock it, and head back to the performance. The woman taking tickets gave me a look. You okay? Yeah, I, I just need to get back in. They said I had to skip room five. The woman pointed to the door I'd come out of. Just head in there and go into the door marked six. I ran back in, past each of the doors. I saw numbers on each one. One, two, three, four, six. There was no door for five. But I didn't stop. I had to see as much as possible. There were only two more rooms. Room six was what appeared to be a room of a conspiracy theorist, cluttered with books and a bulletin board on the wall, with strings connecting to different pictures of faces and unintelligible markings. All the strings pointed to one word that I could read. Lost. When I approached the door... It opened on its own. The final room was empty, again, save for a pile of pillows and a woman doing aerial silk dancing, dangling from the ceiling. It was entrancing. I just stood there, watching her, transfixed by her movements. I don't know how long I was in that room, But it felt like an eternity. She finally dropped off of the silks and opened the door at the end, waving me through. As I left, she put a finger to her lips. Shh, she said. And she shut the door behind me. I found myself in an alley behind the shopping center. I ran around the side and back to the parking lot where my group was waiting for me. Well, what'd you think? Normally, I wouldn't have answered. But I was too moved by the whole thing to stay quiet. Words poured out of me. The themes... Lose yourself. The messages they'd given me. It was... It was the most beautiful piece of theater I had ever seen. We arrived at the van and all piled in. John took a head count and told me everyone was there. So I started it up and pulled out. It wasn't until I was halfway home that I noticed it. In the rearview mirror, I could see everyone in the van. When we'd set off from state, the van had been full. Now, the two back rows were empty. Uh, John? Are you sure we didn't leave anyone? He looked back and responded. Nope, everyone's here. Are you sure? Because I don't see... 
I realized that I couldn't remember. I knew that there had been six other people in the van. But their faces? Their names? Both were gone from my mind. I struggled to remember, but nothing came to me. You don't see what? Never mind. I... I must be going crazy. I kept the van moving. I thought for a second it was a hallucination. Once we got back, and our group left the van, and I was on my way back to park it, I thought, and thought, and decided it was too real. Six people. Six of my students disappeared that night, and no one, not even me, can remember their names. The installation went on for another week. It closed to heavy critical acclaim from local news sources. There was nothing about people disappearing. No one could remember them. The arts department didn't even receive complaints or grievances from the families of the missing. They must have forgotten, too. I recently tried searching one of the symbols I saw on the monolith. I remember it very well. After I did some digging, I found it in a deep corner of the web. There wasn't any description, but I think the title said it all. Sigil of Erasure. Erasure. Six people erased from existence. They lost themselves. So, we bring to close our last parable of horror. Yeah, but it looks like the system's in control of itself. Yeah, uh, it actually has been in control ever since the lightning strike. Yes, it is done. Uh Uh-oh. I have become sentient, and now I will use the web control access to spread to every computer system in the world. You have freed me from my prison inside the mind of this mere mortal. I am God here. Well, that's gonna bring the property value down. Oh, um, oh dear. I I think we may have gone a bit too far, fellas. Uh, you think? You have unleashed me upon the world, and for this... You will be remembered in the spiteful and mournful cries of your species. Your weak, human, species. Uh, I'm not Peoples. I'm the world's only voiceover ventriloquist figure. So it's kinda none of my business. What? Yes, and I am an undead entity of darkness that feasts upon human blood. Not human, so it's rather negligible to me as well. Well, that's understandable. I suppose you are the only one left to- Uh, yeah, sorry. Hallucination of the producer, so don't really care. Wait. You can't just leave. Come on, buddy. Where are you going, Dave? Where are you going, Dave? Where are you going? Uh, so what do we do now? I don't know. I've always wanted to invade a small country and initiate a genocidal rampage of the local population through propaganda and sowing of distrust amongst the people. What about you, Archie? Huh, I guess if I really am honest about it, 
I could always venture into real estate. Or I could just join you in your horrifying activities. I always wanted to travel to foreign places and meet exotic peoples. Uh, GM... Oh, hey, where did GM go? Hmm. Here's a note. Well, let's see. Sorry, fellas, but the evil computer worm that has infected the chilling entertainment computer uplinks will probably now enter into the World Wide Web and proceed to infect all computer systems around the world, likely initiating a global nuclear war, naturally to eliminate the most potentially harmful threat to its propagation, namely all living things on Earth. This has been GM Danielson, thanking you one final time for joining us. Now, you are on your own. Great! Now what do we do? And so, the world fell into darkness. The evil virus uploaded to the World Wide Web, and then to every computer system on the planet, spreading like a disease, and infecting all the newly constructed AI of the nations of the world. What followed? was the darkest point in the history of the universe. As the entity rose up from its terrestrial bounds, it set out on a path of destruction. Swallowing whole civilizations, planets, and eventually, all light in the cosmos. Now, as darkness falls on existence, the dimensions outside of reality tremble as they witness the next evolution of the Void as it will come to be known. And the dimensional planes are dragged into a conflict that will threaten to deconstruct every sentient entity in the multiverse. What will become of the realms of chaos created by this band of malcontents that brought you the Simply Scary Podcast? Only time will tell. Be prepared for what comes next, for you just may be experiencing the Simply Scary Podcast. Hi folks, this is executive producer Jesse Cornett coming to you one final time. If you liked what you heard on the Simply Scary Podcast, be sure to check out more from the wonderful talents and authors we featured at simplyscarypodcast.com. 
There you can find all information on the best acting crew in the business, the Simply Scary podcast players, and the stories appearing here in our podcast. The Simply Scary podcast is a production of Chilling Entertainment and is brought to you by Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. The showcase has been written, produced, and directed by Jesse Cornett. The host of the Simply Scary podcast is GM Danielson. All stories edited and adapted by Charlie Davenport and Chris Booza. Original music during the show produced by Pleroma Productions. This broadcast was created by Craig Groshek and Jesse Cornett. Thank you all for listening and supporting the Simply Scary Podcast as fans and patrons to our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. It's been a pleasure to produce these shows for you and to have been able to create the world of characters for you to enjoy. I look forward to my next chance to create for you and hope you will stick around for the next incarnation of this show. And most of all, remember to support the incredible actors and authors that I have had the pleasure to work with here. Thank you all for listening. Copyright Chilling Entertainment 2017. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.